Hey folks, thanks for dropping by. If you don't know who I am, my name is Chuck Tuck and I am the host of Amazing People, Amazing Things. So if you're returning, thanks for returning. If you're brand new to the show, thanks for stopping by Amazing People, Amazing Things. So today we're going to talk to Michael Canavet. If you're starting work, if you're already in the work field, or if you're like me, nearing the end of your work career. Well, I hope I continue to keep working. I'm not ready to retire anytime soon, but it is very important to start and you need to know where to start. Michael is also going to talk about something that he's come up with that are called the four retirement laps. So listen for that. So if you're ready, let's go ahead and get started. But you know, my reminder is if you're a pet owner, please be responsible and have your pets spayed or neutered. There's a recent poll in the Wall Street Journal uh, that was kind of interesting. They asked, um, what are the, like, is the American dream alive and well, basically, was the question. And, um, like, only a third of the respondents said affirmative to that, um, which if you pulled that, you know, 12 years ago, that poll said, like, over 50% still believed in the American dream. Now only about a third. And so, you know, it feels to a lot of people like it's slipping away, and they can't put their finger on the exact reason Sometimes they'll blame a political party or they'll blame some other factor, but it's a combination of factors is the real answer. And, and, and you know, that's, that's one of the things that makes it difficult. It's not just a one issue um, topic. Yeah, um, and it, it seems like even with this friend of mine who's doing well, he put the blame on his losses on presidential candidate. Uh, who you, I, I don't want to get into the politics, but yeah, he's pointing the finger over to one direction saying, be, yeah, <laughs> because of them, I've lost a lot of money. Yeah, there's a lot of lies people tell themselves about money. That might be one thing we could talk about, like some of the common ones. Um, you know, people like myth busting, generally speaking. And there's a lot of lies we tell ourselves. And it's not, you know, something we do intentionally. It's just the conclusion we leap to a lot of the time. Yeah. But the key is to have an empowering story behind whatever it is you're doing, uh, not tell yourself limiting stories. Uh, that's why the first third of my book is about how to, tell, how to write the story behind your financial plan. And then I talk about strategies and tactics with the second two thirds of the book. But most investment books are just about strat strategies and tactics. And, and you know, we forget that like underneath all that are emotions and, and our own unique story in our lives. And, you know, cookie cutter solutions from the financial world don't resonate with people because they're not cookies. They're complicated. Yeah. So it's just something that like, I'm pretty passionate about that part of the message just because I feel like it's missing in the financial world. I think I stumbled on it by accident in my own life. And, uh, and I'm just glad that I did because, uh, it makes everything easier to solve for when you actually look at your own life, what really actually matters to you and not just what you think you're supposed to do because society tells you or something you see on TV or whatever the case may be. Right. Uh, and, you know, you're talking about, uh, well, emotions and things like that for finances and lies that we tell ourselves. And I remember I had a, an investment property and uh, I was, I had a squatter and I was still paying oh, nine yeah, months. You're one of the people that can, oh, wow, that's such a crazy thing that happens. Ugh, squatters. And, they're, real, they're real. Oh, no. <laughs> Well, one of my other friends who is heavy into investments, he said, you know what, Chuck, don't get emotional about this. This is an investment. You either you win some, you lose some. You cut yeah. your losses now. You know. That's a great piece of advice he gave you. And that once I took that, it put me at ease and the loss was a loss. Um, but, you know, do you run across a lot of people in your business where they are so emotionally involved that they they get themselves so sick about a loss, whether it's a large or small one? Absolutely. Yeah. The, where, there's a time um, that I, I, so before I became a portfolio manager, I was a research analyst, but I also traveled oh. around the country to do investor meetings. And that was really important because when you're a research analyst in some ivory tower looking at spreadsheets and numbers, trying to make objective decisions. Sometimes you lose sight of there's real people that you're serving as the clients. And these people don't think the way you do. They don't have a CFA. They don't crunch the, the discounted cash flow models. They think in terms of their life, their emotions, their past, present, and future, and all kinds of things that make it hard to decide what to do and when. 
Uh, and one good example of that is I, I did a meeting in the just the it was probably near the bottom of the 2008 bear market. Uh, I, I was in Dallas. Uh, it was March of 2009. That's when the S&P 500 bottomed after the biggest bear market since the Great Depression. And that was a tough meeting, of course, because a lot of people were riled up about, you know, how long can this go on? When's the bottom going to happen? What if it's another depression? And I remember one guy that was there that day, he was in his late 50s, and he, he raised his hand, and, and his question was whether he should sell his General Electric stock from his portfolio. So what I learned to do is before I answer a question like that, I ask questions because I want to understand more about the person's story before I, I try to give any advice. So I, I'm fishing for what's the background on this position, and, and it turns out that it's a position that had been in his family for generations. Um, and so I asked him, you know, if his, if his family held the shares through the Depression. He said, yeah. And I asked him how he thought his grandfather probably felt during that time. He said, probably not good. And then I proceeded to talk about why the current landscape in 2008 it was, or 2009, I guess, was, was, was very different than the Depression and uh, not nearly as severe uh, in terms of the unemployment rate or a lot of things going on in the economy. And, and, and what I was trying to do there was help him connect the dots to the fact that, you know, his family had a super long time horizon on their General Electric shares. And he was just losing sight of that in the moment because he was being reactive to the negative news, the, the plunging stock price. I think it was down 70 percent from the high when we had this meeting about. So it was very normal that he was wondering if he should just pull the plug, right, because he's in charge of this portfolio for his family and he felt a real sense of obligation to do the right thing. And, as we talked about it, and he was very emotional, I, I realized that the family history is a key part of what made him so emotional. And once I saw that coming out in the conversation, I knew right away I was going to try to get him to hold on to the shares. And it wasn't because the P.E. ratio was low. And it wasn't because there's was some technical signal that said now's the time to buy GE or hold it. My pure reason was this man's emotionally conflicted, and that's never a good time to make a financial decision. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about the, the fact that Lehman Brothers had gone bankrupt and their, the balance sheet had some stuff on it, the GE, even though they had a financial unit, didn't have. So I, I drifted towards logic to, to get him to hold on to the shares. But, um, it, it, the t but first I needed to get him to calm down, right? Yeah. And, and sometimes we need to do that for ourselves. Uh, and, and it's one thing if you don't have a financial advisor, that's probably the number one thing a financial advisor could do for a lot of people is just provide that emotional stabilization when things get rocky. Uh, because anybody who's a well-trained financial advisor knows that the key is to help your clients make objective decisions to achieve their long-term goals. And the last thing you want to do is be emotional because that's where a lot of the big errors come into play. Selling a market bottom is something that can do long-term damage. Uh, I always tell people that if you're gonna evacuate from your portfolio, do it before the storm arrives. Don't wait until it's a category five. Birth. <laughs> yeah, go run outside and get away. No, you gotta leave earlier. You do not leave. You hunker down, and you ride through the storm. And that's what you gotta do sometimes with investments. Uh, but it's 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 some it's sometimes hard to do, right? Yeah. When something that's when someone yells fire in the back of a theater, our urge is to just run out. We don't want to sit there and, do I smell fire? Do I see fire? No, we just want to react because that's our survival brain working you know, on overdrive to protect us. But our, our survival brain, even though it can save our life, it can ruin our, our investments and our long-term returns if we are too emotional. I guess it's that fight or flight. But there, I, I'm, one thing I'm really glad that you had said because, you know, I... I Taking my friends, I'll put them in two categories, those who do and those who don't, meaning that so many people want to build wealth, but they don't want to pay to build wealth, meaning they, they don't bring in a financial advisor. And then they're playing this gambling game, getting too emotional, thinking they know what they're doing, and they're losing money. So what you're saying is a perfect example, I think, of why uh, – Folks need or should have a financial advisor or, or you know, someone uh, that's knowledgeable like yourself that's been through all the courses, the classes, and you know exactly what to look for. But it, yeah, one thing I write about in the book is that a financial advisor that's worth hiring should pay for themselves and then some. Mm -hmm. They should add more value than they charge in fees. Is what I mean by that. Yes. 
Uh, and that's 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 definitely possible. I mean, there's a great study that Vanguard puts out called Advisor Alpha, and they quantify what's the excess return net of fees that you could get from working with a, a advisor. And just from behavioral coaching alone, I think it adds like 150 basis points a year, 1.5 percent, maybe it's up to three percent. But but the the financial advisor that actually knows what they're doing, whether it's helping you mitigate taxes by doing tax loss selling in your taxable accounts or behavioral coaching that helps you not succumb to the whims of the market and be too reactive to, you know, a lot of other things, intelligent asset allocation. Most people don't realize that the number one investing decision is what is the proportion of stocks, bonds, and cash in your portfolio. You can pick the best stocks, that's fine, but like being in stocks in general is a bigger decision than being in cash. And one generation that doesn't seem to understand that very well right now is the millennials. They a lot of a, a huge portion of millennials' portfolios is in cash, gold, or Bitcoin, like everything but stocks. And and for some reason, there's a bias against stocks. Uh, but you know what? Um, stocks are the best performing asset class over the very long term, handily beating bonds, cash, anything else you can name. So you know you want to understand you know, what your asset allocation is, make sure it's prudent for you based on your time horizon, risk parameters, and, and growth objectives. Uh, and, and an advisor can help just kind of just organize everything for you. Uh, it doesn't mean everyone needs to work with an advisor. If you love markets and you do a lot of research and you have no problem, you know, maintaining spreadsheets and thinking about tax loss harvesting yourself and intelligently allocating to different investments, then then great, you know, but but you still better make sure that you're not going to be too reactive at the wrong time. And, you know, if you don't have any history of going through a bear market and surviving it intact, like I, I would caution you to not to be too confident there because I've seen so many people just, you know, the, the bear markets are, are, are like clutch time in a basketball game in the fourth quarter. It's like you can win or lose the game in those moments. They're not a big percentage of the overall game, but they're like the clutch time yeah. where things are won and lost. And the reason I say that is because like, you know, if that man that sold his GE at the bottom in 2009, when I was talking to him, I mean, he would have done irreparable damage. He would have had to make hundreds of percents, to, you know, well over 100% to, to make up for that 70% drawdown that he had just suffered. You know, if he's still holding the stock today, which I have no idea if he is, but uh, the stock's gone up hugely since then, like hundreds of percents. And, and so, you know, are you able to weather the storm on your own or not is something people need to look in the mirror and answer for themselves. Uh, you can do it yourself with some simple strategies. I write about that in my book. Um, and, uh, you know, but if you're going to hire an advisor, you shouldn't look at it as, a, as an expense. You should look at it as an investment. It's mm -hmm. one of the most important investments you can make. There's 380,000 financial advisors in the United States. So, how do you pick the right one for you? That's something I talk about in my book as well. There's certain criteria you can use to try to find someone who specializes in the things you care about. Uh, I talk about the types of credentials you should look at uh, that distinguish what you know level of expertise different advisors may have. Um, so it's not easy, but it's certainly possible to, to find a good advisor that can, can earn their fees. Yeah, I would imagine too that um, when somebody starts chasing the market, um, chasing the pot of gold, they lose sight of their risk tolerance. They begin to risk more and go beyond what their tolerance is, which could be very dangerous. And I think that's another reason that having somebody such as yourself, you know, and having your book um, would be a wise investment and decision. And in fact, Michael, let me make sure that I get your last name correct so people know it's, is it pronounced uh, Canavet? Pretty close. Canavet, like Canavet. Chevrolet. Yeah, but uh, most people say Canavet, so that's fine too. Canavet. My kids just say Canavet because that's what all their teachers call them, so like, <laughs> we're just going to say it that way. Like, all right, <laughs> well, we'll make sure we get it right, and then spelling is C-A-N-N-I-V as in Victor, E-T. Uh, right. I'm looking at your book here. How do you want me to let, – let, let's talk about this book here. Okay. I like this countdown clock. Or, you know, I'm calling it a countdown clock on there, but uh, the four minute retirement plan. So, mm -hmm. retirement yeah. is important. I see people retiring, honestly, I see friends retiring at 50 and some going to 60, and then others saying, I can't retire. So, what's this book all about? <laughs> 
Sure. Um, so the four minute retirement plan is about how to create a retirement plan that's customized for you in four minutes or less. Okay. Uh, the way that you do that is there's there's what I call four retirement laps, a uh, savings lap, an investing lap, a lifestyle lap, and a legacy lap. And within those four quadrants, I have three chapters each, uh, and I take people through different issues that relate to whether you're saving money, investing money, building your lifestyle or your legacy, what are the common challenges, and, and I usually tell a, I tell a story at the beginning of every chapter so you can understand the human element that goes into each of these issues. Uh, and then I present four strategies you can use to conquer whatever the challenge is that's pertinent to that chapter. Mm. And I challenge people at the end of each chapter to take 20 seconds or less to pick one of those strategies that they think best resonates with them. Okay. Because everything I've got 48 strategies that are time-tested and proven to get you from point A to point B on whatever problem you're trying to solve. None of them are perfect strategies, but the good news about that is there's no such thing as a perfect strategy, Chuck. Uh, there's a lot of very good strategies that you can use, but I think where people fall short with retirement planning is they get paralysis by analysis. They just sit, they, 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 there's too much to assimilate and they're not sure what to do because this person says something persuasive and then this other person disagrees with them and they don't know who to, whose opinion to trust. And we're kind of just blown in the wind a lot of the time. Or maybe we, we actually do some things that are pretty good in terms of we save our money wisely, let's say. Some people are really good at budgeting, but they're terrible investors. Save a bunch of money and invest it poorly, the money can go away. A lot of crypto investors learned that lesson the hard way a few years ago. Yeah. Um, if we save our money well, invest it well, build up a financial war chest, but are miserable in our lives because our lifestyle sucks, what's the point? <laughs> you want to use your money to live a better life. That's the key to being really wealthy, in my opinion. Um, and so I talk about strategies for that, and then I also talk about strategies for how, how to ultimately leave a, a rich legacy. Um, and, and you can do that in a lot of different ways. It starts with the most simple thing, most simple thing of all, which is everyone should have a will, but less than 50% of American adults have a will. Yeah. So what that means is there's a lot of people dying every year, leaving headaches for their loved ones and paying way too much of their estate to attorneys and tax people rather than the people they cared about. That's no way to go out. So what I think is tough about retirement is it's this long-term goal it's the longest term goal for most people. Um, it's kind of like an infinite race. It never really ends. If you think about it, it goes to the end of your life and even beyond in terms of your legacy. That means there's a lot of time to cover. There's other goals other than just retirement that you need to solve for usually. If you're 30-something, you know, you may want to buy a house, pay for your kid's college, um, you know, before you retire. And so how do you balance your short-term priorities, your medium-term priorities, your long-term priorities? So my book's about chunking it down into a, a, a simpler race. Uh, and, and I think if, if you do that with anything, um, you're going to be better off. Yeah, the way you explained your book, it definitely sounds like it's, it's well put together and very easy to understand. And, you know, just take the time to follow it. The two things I want to say is that, you know, I, 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 this is the sense that I get. And again, this is just from my, I'll call it my peers, my friends and things like that. Lifestyle and legacy are the hardest ones, it seems like, for the people I know to wrap their brains around. It's, I want to live my lifestyle the way I'm living it now, yeah. but then they're, what legacy are you going to have? Because these friends of mine, 90% of them are family people, and I know about 50% don't have a, a will or anything put together. Yeah. Uh, why is it, have you, have you, do you have a sense of why it's so hard for, for, for people, for us to uh, to do these things, to change their lifestyle, and to think ahead for the legacy. Yeah, absolutely, uh, and you're spot on. I see that with my clients too. It's not just your friends; it's a common issue for a lot of people. And I think it's just hard to balance our present and future priorities well, mm -hmm. because a lot of times they're not congruent with one one another. Um, if we spend too much now, we have less to save for later. But if we're all future focused and not enjoying the present moment, we're not really living, we're not enjoying the journey to wherever it is we're trying to go. So that's why the first third of my book is about how to write the story behind your financial plan. Okay. Uh, and, and I do that to help with this problem because I think everybody has short term, medium term and long term priorities that they need to balance. Um, and you can do that pretty easily with something called the 50-30-20 formula. Uh, for budgeting. Uh, and, and what that says is 50% approximately of your income should go towards needs 
things like the roof over your head or, or the food that you eat, like the, the needs, right? Mm -hmm. And then 30% should be what I call like a fun money budget. So this would be your money for guilt-free consumption in the here and now for your lifestyle. Uh, so I challenge people to think back into their past and what are the things that have made them the happiest and brought them the most joy? Where were you? Who were you with? What were you doing when you had a time in your life that was really valuable to you? That you really felt on track and happy and, and try to figure out what are those happiness triggers? You know, a lot of people think, I'll wait to be happy when I retire. And that's a fantasy. That's one of the financial lies that we tell ourselves. You should be happy now and in the future because you never know how long you're going to be around. One of the stories I tell in the book is about a gentleman named Ozzy Dahl. He's a guy who worked at a hospital, um, not a famous person, but he's, he's, he, I read about him because of something very unique that happened to him. At his retirement party when he was 64, he's given his retirement speech to all of his friends and family. And right after he gave that speech, Chuck, he died. Wow. That was not in his retirement plan, I'm sure. No. Now, most people want to retire around 65. He got there a year early. He was 64. But he didn't have 20 years of retirement like he probably thought he did. He died right there in his retirement party. And that exposes one of the biggest question marks we all have with our long-term financial plan is we don't know how long we're going to be around. So you can't wait till later to be happy because the things that you, there's no like rite of passage where I make this much money and now I'm always happy or I achieve this goal and I'm always happy. You know, that's obviously not true. We all know it. We've all been there, uh, but we, we forget it sometimes. So I think it's important to have a fun money budget that you actively manage just like you actively manage your long-term goals. And that's something a lot of financial people don't always talk about. They, they're very, they try to get you focused very much on the long term. And it's like you got to make all these sacrifices in the short term so you can achieve this long term vision. But sometimes the long term goal isn't even something that's really inspiring. Like saying I'm going to retire at 65, some people might, that may sound great. Some people may be scared to death of that if they're a workaholic and all their friends are at work. Like that can be very scary to, to lose that part of your life. Yeah. So, you know, what are you doing sacrificing in the short run for some long term goal that doesn't even excite you to get up in the morning? I like to say hollow goals produce shallow outcomes. I like that. So you got to have inspiring goals. That's the starting point of a solid financial plan. It's not in the numbers, it's in the narrative. Get the narrative right, you can reverse engineer the numbers you need to create that movie of your life in the future that you're envisioning. But first you got to think of what's the screenplay I want to write. And you got to remember you're the director of the show as well as the actor in the show. So I try to help people in the book like, you know, when they're crafting their story, to, to think of themselves as a character in a movie. Think of your life as a movie. What would be a rich story for the next chapter? How would you like this to evolve? And remember that you're the author, director, and actor in the movie. And when you do that, you remember how powerful you are. Because all of us are gonna face adversity at one point or another. I've seen it, and I've seen it with my clients, and some of us come through the storm better than others. But a lot of what helps us persevere is when we know who we are and who we wanna be, and we don't let anything stop us from that. Um. I, I I love that. It's uh, it's easy enough to imagine writing the story, and you write the story, and like I said, you put yourself in there. You are the main character. Now you're the writer or you're the director. So yeah. Um, then I also like your fifty thirty twenty rule too. And the way I look at that is uh, go, going. I'm going to slip back to maybe the the late twenties to maybe early 40 ish you know and your income is going to be a really fluctuating i think during that time period so you're going your 50 30 20 some might say why well, only make a thousand dollars so you know you might want you might need to fudge a little bit it's not, i'm going to say it's not a hard 50 30 20 would that be okay to say and just yeah. kind of you gauge can, where you're at there's by. flexibility yeah. if you start saving earlier you can you can go a little under the 20 if you're trying to catch up if you're in your late 30s or 40s and you haven't really saved too much then you know you you need to be 20 percent or higher maybe 30 mm percent -hmm. uh, so you can move the pie chart around a little but it's good to have the pie chart in my opinion because what it does is it gives you that ticket to guilt-free consumption that you crave and everyone deserves that in case you don't live a very long life, uh, you're, you're making the most of your resources while you are here and you're creating beautiful memories because those are emotional assets. 
You know, having when you know when, when people die at the end of their life, hospice workers will tell you they don't sit around lamenting that they don't have more money in the bank account. They think about the opportunities not taken, their chances not taken, or that if they're thinking in a positive fashion, they're thinking about the memories with the key people that they loved. They're not thinking about the number in their in their bank account at that point. So we need to remember that, and we need to treat our present hedonism budget. The 30% fund money budget is something that I think is underemphasized, very important. Uh, and the way I would like to see people allocate that is to make sure that they're allocating the money wisely to things that they truly enjoy. Sometimes we're just on autopilot with our spending. We have this subscription, that subscription. We do this because we did it before. We don't even like it anymore, but we're still doing it because we're creatures of habit. So I, I like to have people really think about what happiness triggers being embodied in each thing that you're spending money on. And then and schedule this time for yourself. Schedule fun time with your family and friends or just a solo activity. And honor it as an appointment on your calendar just as important as anything that's work-related. Most people don't do that. But if you do do that, one thing that's great about present hedonism or enjoying the short-term moments is it re-energizes you, which gives you more fuel to achieve your long-term goals. So balancing the short term and the long term is very hard, but it's certainly possible. It just takes a little introspection on what we are trying to do. Michael, everything that you're saying really resonates with me. And it, it uh, I don't know how to put this, but it's, it's so well put that I don't understand how people, if they, if they listen to you, if they get your book, how they don't understand how to implement this and to get it started. Because the way you're laying it out, it's an easy plan. And like I said, it's this is a four minute plan. Take the time, take a little bit of time. It's an investment in your lifetime. Um, and I just wanna add along to that where you're saying, you know, people who are ill and they're, we'll just say on their deathbed or whatever, they don't wish oh i wish i would have made more money oh i wish I it's i wish i would have gone here i wish i would have done this i wish take the time you've got your like you said if you've got your 30 percent slush fund make plans plan don't sit there and go well i'll get around to it you don't know you just don't know you don't know, and Ozzy Dahl is an embodiment of that. But the good news about that man's story is he lived a very rich life before he passed away at 64. That's good. He did very well in his career, worked there for 20 years, got like some award at the end of his career, um, had a family that he was really close with, did fun things. Like he loved Bruce Springsteen. He'd go to Bruce Springsteen concerts. He'd go to college basketball games. He had family card games at his house all the time. It was an open-door policy for friends and family to come and go. He lived a very uh, rich life while he was here before he retired. And that's good preparation for retirement, in my opinion, because the idea that retiring, you know, that might be nice if you don't have to go to a job that you don't like anymore, but it's not purpose driven enough to make you happy waking up, you know, a few weeks into retirement, a few months, you know, if the phone's not ringing and you don't have a purpose to get up in the morning and go do something that makes you feel like you're progressing in your life, you feel like you're dying already. There's a, you know, if you think about sharks, they can't breathe if they swim backwards. They have to swim forwards or they die. Human psychology is similar. We have to be making progress at all stages of our life or we're emotionally dying. And, and it takes a physical toll as well. So I, 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 I'm a fan of the way Ozzy Dahl lived his life before that retirement party. And I think it's a great lesson for all of us. Yeah, uh, but don't go spend all your money now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't spend it off. You can balance. So that's the beauty of the 50, 30, 20. Yes. A lot of people, they, they, they lament, I can't get ahead because of inflation, or I don't make enough at my job, or this excuse or that excuse. But the bottom line is, if you have an income and you follow the 50, 30, 20 rule, you can get ahead. You just yeah. got to commit to it. And that's I, the I, only I, thing that a lot, a lot of people want to make excuses, but I, I, there's no excuse that, that circumvents that. That's the reality. If you have an income and you do the 50, 30, 20 rule, you will be having fun in the present and saving for the long term. And, and it's important to not forget about the long term because even though it may seem far away, um, you know, psychological studies have shown that people think of their future self as like a distant uh, person that's not even related to them. They think of it like a stranger. Uh, and, and that's not the reality. You wanna be your own best, best friend in the future. So you gotta prepare for 
that future in a way that's going to serve you. And, you, and uh, it's just hard sometimes when we get caught up in the short term of our life. That's why writing a story about your life is so helpful because it makes you step back and look at the big picture. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't start with today. That starts with looking into the past and trying to learn th some lessons from it. Like, you know, what were the happiest times of your life and why? And when you ask that question, you can usually tie it into some core values that were represented in that period that you were really happy and thriving. You know, if you're a creative person, you're probably not happy in any environment you've ever been in if you weren't allowed to be creative. You know, if, if a very creative person joins the army and just has to do drills all day and can't do anything creative, they're probably not going to be happy because they're not living their core values. And so what happens a lot of times as we get older is we lose sight of what our core values are unintentionally. Uh, and we make decisions that aren't really best for us. We, we let society influence where we go or what we do because it sounds good in societal lens, but it's not really our lens. Yeah. So if you preserve your past and you know what your core values are and you link them to your future goals, then it all becomes one big story that you're really more in control of because you understand what makes you tick better. And a financial advisor can help with that, but they can't solve for it on their own. Like it's up to you to know what your story really is. And uh, I think that's one of the missions in writing the book. I, I don't, I've never read a financial book that one third of it's about how to write a, a narrative that's empowering. But I feel like that's something that is, is important to bring into the industry because that will help make it more personal. We need to m personalize what we do in this realm. That makes it a lot more you know, exciting and, and, and less intimidating and um, you know, just more customized. Yeah, and just listening to you talk right now, it, it really... This financial investment is also also an, an emotional investment, it sounds like, too, because there's a lot of emotions tied around your your finances and your financial well-being. And I think that's the key word is well-being, and that's an all-around thing. So uh, I just want to add one quick thing where, you know, we're talking about our 50, 30, 20 and slush funds. Uh, back in the older days, your dad, your grandparents used to say, save 10, pay, pay yourself 10% of your salary. But the excuse that I used back at that time is I don't make enough. And I want to just say that, no, like, like you're saying, Michael, is if you have an income, you can do things. You can pay yourself. You can do the 20%, save it. Because once you get used to it not being there, you learn to live on what you have. And it took me too many years to learn that, so. Exactly right. I tell a story that embodies that lesson perfectly, I think, uh, in the book. It's the story of Theodore Johnson. He's a guy who worked at UPS uh, as a middle management type guy. He was a VP at the height of his career, but he never earned more than $14,000 in a, in a single year. When he died, his estate was worth $70 million. How the heck did he pull that off? Well, at first, he was stuck in inertia because he felt like he couldn't get ahead. And he lamented to a friend one day, it just, I can't save any money. No matter, it, just, it just goes as quick as I, I make it, I spend it. And the friend asked him a question that changed his life. He said, what if you just pretend to tax yourself? Ding, ding, ding. That little question, like, it resonated logically and emotionally with him. And, and the, thing, the, the other thing the friend said is, if you're going to pay Uncle Sam taxes, why not pay yourself before Uncle Sam? Aren't you more important than Uncle Sam? Yes. So that man started putting 20% of what he earned, no matter what, into his long-term investment account. He got a little lucky in how he invested, and he broke some rules there. He put most of the money into UPS stock, which was his employer, so he trusted it. He got very fortunate because that company did super well in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, and that's a key part of what made his, his estate grow so much. But, you know, he started off like a lot of people do. Like you may have been at one point. Like, I just don't, I don't know how to get ahead. I don't know how to save. Yeah. And when he made it a big enough priority because he had a why, he found a way. And then that's when progress was ignited. And he, uh, he lived a very rich life after that. Um. I'm just going to say to the audience, you will be amazed at what you can save once you start. And we've all heard compound and interest. You know, that's a big one. We don't even need to get into that. But Michael, I want to make sure that people know where to go to get your book. So give us the, give us the lowdown on that. <laughs> the biggest bookstore in the world is Amazon. That's a great place <laughs> yeah. to buy it. Uh, Barnes & Noble, Target, it's at all of them. 
Um, so, you know, you could take your pick. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, that, that's a good place to go find it. And now I won Amazon bestseller last month. I was excited about that. Oh, congratulations on that. And Thank you, you do perfect. have a, a, a website, too, with your name, correct? Yes, michaelcanave.com, C-A-N-N-I-V-E-T, V is in Victor. Or you can go to our corporate website, which is silverlight.us. Okay, we'll make sure we have all that information in the show notes. Uh, before we cut out of here, what would you advise uh, some like a 20-year-old, somebody that's really just starting into the workforce? What should they do? I mean, we talked about a lot of stuff that seem, sounds logical that they should follow, but what would you advise them right now? My number one advice to somebody who's in their 20s would be diversify your skills before you worry about diversifying your portfolio. And what I mean by that is I believe it's important more than ever to be a triple threat in whatever we, whatever we do. A lot of job skills are becoming obsolete quicker than ever. If you're a computer coder, that sounded five years ago like a really surefire way to a nice steady income because that job was in demand, but now AI is starting to write computer code and a lot of people are freaking out. They might become obsolete. That's happening in a lot of different industries. And so one thing that you can do to risk manage your human capital, which is what you use to build financial capital, your human capital is your future earning power discounted to the present. So that's a more valuable asset for a young person than the, any financial capital they're likely to have unless they got a big inheritance when they're really young. So what I would say is don't sell out for short-term compensation. Pursue your dreams and passions that are related to your core values. Find a job that you're good at and enjoy and blend together multiple skills that you can use to distinguish yourself in the workplace. One of the examples I give in the book is Jennifer Lopez. She's had a tough year this year. But one of the reasons she's so successful in such a fragile industry, the entertainment industry is like the most difficult industry I could ever imagine to, to get to the top and stay on top. And she's managed to do that for a very long time. Uh, it's because she's not just a singer. She's not just a dancer. She's not just an actress. She's a triple threat. She can do all three. Yeah. She's not the best at any one of them, but she's a unique combination, right? And she's also a very savvy businesswoman. So that's something we can all embody in our own way. Uh, one of the examples I point to in the book is like if you're a personal trainer, let's say, don't just know how to train people physically. Maybe you can also be a good nutrition coach and maybe you can also get really good at social media marketing to build your practice so that you can be better than the other personal trainers out there. You're doing more for your clients. You know how to market your services better. You have a much better chance to survive and thrive in that industry. Uh, and we could do that in anything. If you're an accountant, but you're also a good presenter, you know, a lot of accountants aren't very good at, at, at public speaking. So, like, that could be a really great combination that you have if you have the ability. So that would be my advice to young people is, is to think about what skills they want to blend together to create their own triple threat. I like and that. And then they'll really take care of itself because they'll earn, they'll earn well if they're doing what they're meant to do. I, like I said, I really like that. And the first person I thought of wasn't J-Lo, but I thought of George Foreman. Oh, yeah, Boxing. great example. <laughs> Boxing. Well, where do you go after that? Well, you could be a commentary guy, but maybe you won't be. But, you know, that's kind of a limited field. You know the George Foreman grill? You know George Foreman has clothing? Like I said, he's, he's branched out in a lot of areas. Um, again, Michael... Thank you very much for for setting me straight and in the right direction for an old guy. And young people out there, listen to what Michael had to say as well. Um, once again, uh, the book is A Four-Minute Retirement Plan. And as Michael said, you could get that at the largest bookstore, Amazon or Barnes & Noble. So all the stuff will be in the show notes. Michael, thank you very much. Thank you, Chuck. I appreciate it. Yeah.